So grateful, church, for what God is doing in our midst, in the next generation. How many of you know what happens in one generation affects the next one? And part of what God has calling us to do in this generation is to impact the next generation. It's so good to be with all of you this morning. And I just want to say a quick hello to everyone in Colorado Springs, in Lone Tree, in Mexico City, and everywhere else that God is birthing and lifting up His glorious name as we're planting churches. It's so good to be with all of you. Uh, We're in a series right now called End Time Survival Guide. I love that name. And we, in particularly the last few weeks, going through the seven churches uh, found in the early parts of the book of uh, 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 Revelation. And today we're going to be looking at the last church, the seventh church, the Laodicean church. And if you have your Bibles, if you'll open up with me to Revelation chapter 3, We're going to be reading from verses 14 through 22. Let's read. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither hot, cold, nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say I am rich. I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. And solve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray together, church. Lord, we just come before you this morning, and we ask that we would have ears to hear. Ears to hear what you are saying to us, and a heart to respond to your words. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm excited to go through the, and talk about the Laodicean church. Not the one that you always want to pick at the forefront. But I tell you, particularly about Laodicea, I think everyone knows they're known as the lukewarm church. They're the ones that were complacent. But I think it's so important to have an understanding of those that maybe didn't walk the way rightly. Because it gives a metric to how we should walk. Before I jump in too much to my sermon, I just want to give some context about Laodicea. If you have the picture, you can put it up there. I love maps. I love archaeology. I love history. So before we dive in, this is where Laodicea is uh, located. In modern-day Turkey, in Asia Minor. And if you go to the next picture there, you'll see that a lot of the seven churches we've been talking about, they're all right here. You have Smyrna up there. You have Ephesus right over here. You've got Philadelphia. So many of them. Sardis is right there. You've got so many in this particular region as well. And of course, there's Laodicea. There's a city called Heropolis a few miles to the north of it. There's a city called Colossae a few miles to the south of it. And of course, Paul's letter to the Colossian church is to that church right there. Just to give you some context. Now this particular region, this is a very fertile region. A lot of different water sources, but what's kind of interesting about Laodicea is they didn't have their own organic water source. So for their hot water, they actually had to go to Hierapolis, which had a lot of hot springs. If they wanted cold water, they had to go to Colossae. And in fact, they were such an ingenious people. And um, they, they built aqueducts from Colossae all the way to Laodicea. 
However, by the time that the cold water got over there, it would become lukewarm. Interesting. The city of Laodicea, much like the city of Rome, it sat on seven hills. It contained three marble theaters. They were well entertained. They had a vast wall that encompassed them. They were well secured. They had many prosperous industries in that uh, particular uh, city. They had, they had a banking industry, a clothing industry for textiles. They even had a medical school. Interesting, as we kind of examine this passage, all three of those, banking, textile, manufacturing, a medical school, all of those will be referenced by the Lord in His rebuke to the Laodicean church. In particular, they had four markets in that church. Now, to give you some perspective, Roman cities would all usually have a market, the place of business transaction. If you were at least one, if you were a really wealthy city, you'd have two. But not Laodicea. They had four agoras, four marketplaces. When they say that they're a wealthy city, as they do, when they say we're a wealthy people, as they do, they were wealthy by a metric of almost four. In fact, the Roman historian Tacitus recounts when in 60 AD, when there was a huge earthquake that rattled Laodicea and a lot of their buildings had collapsed, instead of receiving aid from the Roman Empire, they rejected it because they were so self-sufficient, they were so wealthy that they didn't even need it and they rebuilt that city all by themselves. Despite all of this, Despite all of their wealth, despite all of their comfort, the reality is that the story of the Laodicean church is actually a tragic one. It's a tragic spiritual story. Jesus tells them in verse number 15, I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. Would that either you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Jesus was saying in verse 15 how it starts. He said, I know, I know that in that word in the Greek for I know is the Greek word edo. It means I can tell. I've considered. I've perceived your works. I know your works. I've edoed your works. Men are masters of deception. And we become competent throughout life at hiding the truth from those around us. We place masks over our faces to hide our actions, our words, our deeds. We grow good at it over the years. We practice it. Why? Because it's sometimes important to enable our survival in a broken world. And we become so competent at deception. I can remember a few years back, I was an aide to camp for a four-star general. We were in Germany, actually. And the beginning of our trip, we were at a northern base in Germany. And we were going to the south of Germany. And, and, and we had a whole evening to ourselves. And I knew the week before that we would have this time. And so I had planned out what I wanted to do. I wanted to go to Austria, which was just a few miles over the border, and, and I had planned out the trip. The only person I had to convince was our four-star general. Not usually the easiest people to convince. But I, I, and so on the whole trip, on the whole drive down from northern Germany to southern Germany, I was talking about Austria. I was talking about the food there. I was talking about how beautiful it is there. And all of a sudden, as we're traveling and going down, I kind of reach in my pocket. And I'm like, where's my passport? And I'm like, oh, man, it's not here. I'm looking on my side, and now I'm starting to panic a little bit, and I'm looking around. It's not there. I left it at the base. So then I immediately pivoted. And I said, you know, actually, I was just thinking, Austria isn't actually this, that, that nice this time of year. In fact, in southern Bavaria, there's some beautiful places that we should go see. Why would we not go see those places? And I could just tell, I still remember that four-star general, he just looked at me. And I could see him through my rear view mirror. He was, he was on to me. 
So I had to change my strategy. His, his wife was actually with us for that particular trip. I turned to her and I said, ma'am, we don't want to go to Austria. Have you seen the, I've heard about this Wiener schnitzel that's in southern Bavaria. It will take you to heaven and back again. That's what we need to go do. It's, and, and, I'm, and I can tell he's like, no, I want to go to Austria. And I said, ma'am, no, this is the place we got to go. So finally, she agreed. And, and because she agreed, he agreed. And we went to southern Bavaria. And no one knew I didn't have my passport. Because what you don't know is I was on my last, uh, last strikeout. I had done so many mistakes. I had run a stop sign, hit a curb, forgot his schedule, mismanaged his whole port. I mean, it, I had done it all. And he was looking for a reason to get rid of me. And the only survival mechanism I could think of was to deceive that I, didn't, I wasn't going to let him know I didn't have my passport. Well, the last day of the trip is, is over. And, and we're not flying out until the until the evening of that day, which means we have a morning and an afternoon to go have some free time. Now, I tried everything to get my passport. Everything. And I called that base, I mean, I called the commander of that base. No captain at that time should be calling the commander of a base and be like, can you please help me? But that's exactly what I did. I said, can you please find my passport? And they did that entire base, searched, found my passport, but they could not ship it to the place where I was at. Some rules, some law, I don't know what it was. They could only ship it to a place that was 1.2 miles away from the place that we were staying. An important number for me, as you'll find out. This story's going somewhere. <laughs> Plus, it's a good story. And so I'm now in the dilemma that in this free time, I have to get close enough to go get my passport without letting my boss know. And he said that morning, he said, you know what? There's this beautiful hike that's like two hours away. Let's go there. I can't do that. So I turned to the ma'am, and I said, ma'am, there's this one cafe. It's right pretty close to here. They have this coffee, and they have this one croissant. You can't imagine. And the view of this place. And she said, you know, I'd like to go there. And I can tell he's so irritated with me. I can tell he knows that something is up. But there's no way I'm telling him that his idiot aid does not have his passport. There's no more I'm giving him. And sure enough, I took them to that cafe. I said, oh, by the way, I just got to go do something real fast. I put down my coffee. I ran the 1.2 miles to the uh, post office that my passport had been shipped to, put it in my pocket, ran the 1.2 miles back, went into the bathroom, washed my face, sat down, finished my coffee, got up, and we flew out of there. And, and you know what? I just, I just saw him. Went on, he, he went on to be the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, but he was retired for many years. This was like a decade ago. So he had been retired for many years, and we were sitting down and having coffee and just chatting. And I thought to myself, Maybe I'll tell him now. Maybe because I knew he knew that something was happening. But I said, I'm going to maybe tell him now. And I thought, no, let's just, no I, there's no way I'm going to tell him. To this day, I haven't told him. Hopefully, sir, you're not watching this one. But that's what happened. I apologize about that. But the point I'm trying to make is, is that we grow good at becoming deceptive. And if we were to analyze our life, we do it so we can survive in a broken world. But we can mistake this, that God operates the same way. That God also operates in deception, but He doesn't. And neither does He allow us to do it. And we seek to hide from God. And although we can deceive man, we cannot deceive the Lord. He knows. And I'm so grateful that He knows. I'm so grateful that He edos. And I really think, church, that part of gaining true freedom in the Lord Jesus Christ is acknowledging and understanding that He knows. He knows. But this is what I love about our beautiful Jesus. He knows what is happening in the hearts of the Laodicean church. He knows that they are lukewarm. He knows that they're complacent. But He still comes. 
He still comes, regardless of what you're going through, regardless of what you're hiding, regardless of what you want to keep from everyone else. One, he eddos, but he still comes. We mistake the Lord for thinking that he is like the world. He wants our performance. He wants our facade. No friend. He wants your heart. He wants your heart. We want to hide our pain, our shame, our insecurity, and our addiction. Because we say if, we, if he knew our truest self, he would never come. But he has come. And to the Laodicean church, he knows and he still comes and he shows them who they really are. Church, thank God that he desires to come and show us who we really are. That there was a cancer eating at them. Christ will come to whosoever, but he does not leave us however. He is a good physician who will contend with the cancer that is destroying us. And today I just want to encourage you, I want to challenge you. That thing, whatever it might be, that cancer inside of you, shame, addiction, whatever it might be, he knows he's coming and he desires to bring you true freedom from it. He doesn't operate within the paradigm of the world. He operates in truth and in righteousness. And for the Laodiceans, they had become lukewarm. They had become complacent. And that trap of lukewarmness and complacency, it's something that all of us are susceptible to. All of us. Not a person in this room is not susceptible to it. But it's a spiritual condition that the Lord detests. He said, I will spit you out of my mouth. The words in the Greek for that are literally, I'll vomit you out of my mouth. It's so repulsive to the Lord, that lukewarm, complacent condition. Why? Because lukewarmness is a breeding ground for the parasites that seek to quench The flame of the Spirit in our life. It's a breeding ground for it. And it'll snuff out the things that God wants to birth and bring forth in you and in me. Lukewarmness and complacency. it's It's a posture of the heart that we begin to drift into. It's a condition of the mind. It's a haze of the eyes. It's a, it's, a, it's a misdirection of our looking that leads to spiritual blindness and kingdom impotency. Jesus says, oh, that at least you were cold. That one was surprising to me when I read that. Oh, that you were at least cold. Why? Because a man or a woman who is cold at least knows that they're shivering and that they're at the point of death. A cold man knows, a cold woman knows that you need something to come and warm you. But to live in a lukewarm state is to invite the narrative of a tragedy. And that's exactly what happens to the Laodicean church. It's a tragedy. It's a tragedy because in their own eyes, as it says in verse 17, they were rich and prosperous and needed nothing. But in reality, Jesus was saying to them, you're blinded by your lukewarmness. You're actually, you're actually wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. The Laodicean church didn't start that way. But gradually over time, they began to drift into that condition of lukewarmness that bred a spiritual illness of blindness and kingdom impotency. Why? Two reasons that I'll offer to you. One, Number one, they were measuring their spiritual condition from man-made metrics and not from a revelation of Jesus. Somewhere along the way, church, they had lost their true north and the guiding vision of the Lord Jesus Christ. Somewhere over the years, when they planted the Laodicean church, they didn't start like that. But somewhere along the way, they began to drift and drift and drift and drift and drift. The church in Laodicea, when you read its opening words of the message of the Lord to it, they're not evaluated according to cultural norms. They're not evaluated to the prevailing religious winds and fanciful doctrine of the time. The church of Laodicea is evaluated by the measuring post of the Lord Jesus. They were being evaluated 
by the words of the amen. Verse number 14. The words of the amen is how they were being evaluated. The words of the faithful and the true witness is how they were being evaluated. They were being evaluated by the beginning of God's creation. In John chapter 1 it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness overcomes it not. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness overcomes it not. You see, friends, without light that penetrates into the darkness to eliminate the condition of man, we can never truly understand where we are. Without the decoder ring of his person and his presence, there is no meaning, there is no context, there is no north star to direct us to where we should go, nor to show us our truest conditions inside. And it is a factor that causes drift when he is not the center and the, and the guiding light in our lives. Without him in his light, we are blind, naked, and poor. And for Laodicea, the revelation when Jesus comes into their midst and his light begins to penetrate their darkness, their true condition is exposed. And it was a bleak condition indeed. They were on the precipice of judgment on the precipice of being spewed out of his mouth. Why? They couldn't see him. They couldn't see him. They had lost their vision of him. Their gaze upon him had been broken, and they began to look somewhere else. Number two, reason for spiritual blindness. They grew complacent by virtue of their abundance and blessings. What you are surrounded by you have an increased tendency to become like. What you're surrounded by, you have an increased tendency to become like. What were they surrounded by? They were surrounded by hot water on, to the north and cold water to the south. They were surrounded by the strength of their own arm that had brought in water to their own city and had, it was lukewarm. But they had made it. They were surrounded by richness. They were surrounded by four agoras. They were surrounded by the medical center. They were surrounded by the banking industry. They were surrounded. They, they were self-sufficient. They knew how to do it. If something had to... And what you're surrounded by, you have to be careful. You have a tendency to become like. I'm not saying that those things are bad. You just have to be careful and understand... That you can become like those things. When you're surrounded. By seasons of strength and plenty. It's easy to make the gradual transition. From dependence upon God. Into dependence upon flesh and the self. I heard a missionary many years ago. He was from the far east. And God had used him mightily in that region. And God picked him up from obscurity. And I won't go into his whole story. But he was in a shack somewhere where no one knew. But let me tell you, God will go and find the nobodies out in the distant end on the far reaches of the world. God is not a respecter of persons. He's a respecter of those who diligently seek him. And he found that young man at that time in an obscure place, in an obscure part of the world, because he is looking even at this hour. The Bible says that his eyes are roving to and fro to see whose heart would, would, would pursue him and be pleasing after him and would begin to seek his face. And today, the same is true for what was happening for that young man. The Lord is looking throughout the earth for those whose heart is pleasing to him. And when he finds you, he will pick you up from your obscurity your place but the Lord gave him a warning before he transitioned him to the nations 
and began to use him in a mighty way. In fact, he spoke to him audibly. And the warning that he gave him was from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse number 12. It was the same warning that Moses gives the people of Israel as they were transitioning from a place of slavery into the place of inheriting the promise of God, which is a wonderful thing, but there is an inherent danger to it that I want us to see. And Moses tells the people this. When you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, when your herds and your flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Moses was warning them, when you're satisfied, when your herds and your flocks are plentiful, When there's silver and gold beyond measure, he's saying that's a dangerous time. I'm warning you, don't let your heart become proud, nor forget the Lord your God. But that's exactly what happens to the Laodicean church. They grew confident and strong in their riches and their prosperity and their sufficiency, and they lose their capacity to hunger. Friends, when we lose our capacity to hunger... That's actually a dangerous place. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. But it is a dangerous place that can cause drift in our life. And they take on the identity of their surroundings and they move into a posture of lukewarmness and it breeds a tragedy which causes spiritual blindness to them and makes them ineffective in the kingdom and on the precipice of of losing the lampstand of God from their midst. And the sad part about it is, they don't even know it. I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing, Jesus said, that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. What a tragedy. I was telling Debbie this before, as I was preparing for this sermon, that... It's convicting for me. Because as the Lord begins to examine our hearts, my heart is exposed. To the point where I said, Lord, I don't want to preach this one. Because I honor this pulpit. I honor the Lord. He's so holy. He's so holy. If you think, church, I'm preaching this message at you, you're so mistaken. I'm preaching this message trembling. I'm preaching this message trembling because I know we serve a living God. And I know that he's doing a mighty thing in our midst. I want you to know how I'm coming at this. The heart that says, God, watch me, Lord. Watch me, God. Church, watch us, Lord. Watch us, Lord. That we might navigate around this trap of lukewarmness and spiritual blindness that all of us are susceptible to. How do we do it? Jesus gives the answer in Revelation chapter 3, verse number 18. He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe Clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. And solve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Jesus was telling them, buy three things from me. Gold refined in fire, white garments, and solve to anoint your eyes. That word buy that Jesus was telling them in the Greek, it's the word agoraza. Agora. Marketplace, to go to market, to purchase, to have a transaction. With me, Jesus was saying, and this would have been so striking to that church who who had four different agoras who was used to buying and selling and doing and going to market and purchasing. But he was saying, no, 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 no. Don't buy it from someone else. Don't go somewhere else. Don't have dependency on someone else. He was using their language to tell them, I want you to buy and have agorza with me, not with your plenty but with me 
Buy from me gold tried in fire. Jesus was telling them, I want you to buy that which is truly of value, refined gold. And you can't ever produce refined gold. He was talking about the things that are of true spiritual and eternal value. You can't, you, can, you can't refine gold unless it comes into contact with the fire. In Hebrews chapter 12, the Bible says, For our God is a consuming fire. When they refine gold, it is brought into contact with the fire. And that which is dross, God, or in this case, it begins to be separated from the gold itself. That's the process. And I just have a sense that this is a season that God across the body of Christ is separating. He's separating. He's separating people. He's, and if you think... If you, if you think that he's separating, oh, this person and that person, I would say that you're mistaken. I would say that he is separating all of us. Because in each of us, there is this thing and this mixture of both the dross and the refined. And it is the heart of God in this season, across the body of Christ, that he would come and separate that which is in us. The consuming fire of the Holy God would come and begin to burn in us. Burn in us. And begin to take away that which does not belong. And there is a call that's going out right now that says, come out. Come out. Be separate from. Be different from. Let the dross burn away. There's an invitation of heaven that is going out. To draw near to the flame of God and His person. Is it a dangerous thing to draw near to the fire of God? It is. If you have never encountered the fire of God. The flame of God. One quick story. I was at a meeting one time. The, the fire of God was so powerful and, 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 and so present. It brought such conviction to all of us. And I wanted to go preach at that time. I was the preacher, but the Lord told me not to preach. And I went up on stage to preach as the Lord was moving. And I have never had the dread fear of God come on me like that. I got so scared, I ran to my room. The service still went on. God still moved. But it was a dread fear, and I remembered what... A man of God had once told me, God is like a live wire. There's some things about him that you don't touch. In the Chronicles of Narnia, C.S. Lewis writes a children's tale. And in it, one of the young children will come and ask about Aslan, who is a type of Christ in that story. Is he a good lion? And the response will come back to her, he's a good lion, but he's not a tame lion. Church of the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to tell you, he's a good lion, but there's nothing tame about him. He is an all-consuming fire. And when he steps in to our midst, when he, when he moves in, there's something dangerous about him. When revival truly begins to come in to the house of God, he's like a live wire. There's some things about him you don't touch, but the invitation is still there to come in close to him. Will it burn the flesh? Yes, it will. No man will be left unscathed. No woman will be left unchanged. You can't come into contact with him and be the same. When Jacob... When Jacob encounters the Lord at the brook of Jabbok, I always used to preach the message and I would say, isn't it wonderful how we serve a God? Or, or, or how wonderful it is that Jacob would wrestle with God. Truly, that is amazing. But it is even more amazing, not that Jacob wrestled with God, but that God wrestled with Jacob. That the God of heaven and earth would leave his throne of glory he knew who he was. Jacob was a deceiver. He knows. He edos. He knew. But he still came. Friends, we serve a God who comes 
And he wrestles with Jacob. But Jacob is never the same again. You cannot encounter him. He, forever after that encounter, ever after that wrestling, he, he walks with a limp because the flesh will not survive an encounter with the Lord. And that's exactly what he wants from us. Your flesh and my flesh are being separated at this hour. And that's the call to wrestle with a God who has come down to wrestle with us. Are there any in this time and in this place who will move into a place to say, God, would you wrestle with me? Would you allow your fire to come and touch my heart and touch the places? Yes, Lord, you know. You know my weaknesses. You know my shortcomings. You know my frailties. You know my addictions. You know all of it. But would you come, oh Lord, oh that we might be a people church that would pray that prayer unto him. And he wants to produce in us gold refined by fire. And Lord, my prayer is expose, burn away the dross in each of us. Buy from me, Jesus says, gold refined by fire. Secondly, he says, buy from me white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. What's fascinating, like I told you before, is that Laodicea is a textile hub. They were finely dressed on the outside, but they were naked and full of shame on the inside. Today, there is a generation that is in shame and naked. They think they have everyone deceived because of what they're wearing and how they're going. But their own hearts bear witness. And Christ, I see their true condition. And although he echoes, this is his word to them. He's saying to them, I have a pure covering for you. Take it and buy from me. For each and every one of us today, though he echoes and though he knows, he's saying, I have a pure covering for you. You need not walk in nakedness any longer. You need not walk in shame any longer. Because there is a white garment that I have for you. And that white garment is a costly garment that was purchased with his own blood. It's not any old thing he's asking you to wear. It's a garment that was woven by him upon the cross. In Isaiah chapter 1 verse number 18 it says, Though your skin, sins are white, like, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. In Isaiah 53, God, there's a scene of where God, I believe, weaves that garment. This is where he wove it. And it came at a high cost. He made that garment himself by going to the cross and he was naked on that cross. So that you and I would not have to be naked. In Isaiah 53 it says, As for one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. They couldn't even look at him. He, he was naked there on that cross. His body was broken on that cross. He was bleeding and And surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgression and he was crushed for our iniquities. And as the Savior bled upon the cross, though everyone couldn't see it, he was weaving a garment. Because what happened in Isaiah 53 made true and real Isaiah 61 verse number 10. Because of what he did upon the cross, the prophet writes, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God. Today, friend, you and I can rejoice for what he has done. For he has clothed me with the garment of salvation and he has covered me with the robe of righteousness. Rejoice, rejoice. That was the white garment that he made for his children. 
That their identity might be restored. That the place at his table might be restored. That their calling might be restored. Today, the Lord is calling so many of us into restoration and seat at his table. And there is a white garment that he has for you. That he wants to clothe you with. Clothes often are so much, you know, they they speak to our identity. Who you belong to. What group, tribe you're part of. How many of you know? It, you can tell by the clothes you wear. The fitness group, I can tell. You, they're, 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 I'm like, that's, that's a fitness people. The outdoor people, Fjall, Raven. You know, and you're like, yep. Outdoor person. The Coloradans, easy to spot. Flat brim, hat. You know, you, they, they walk on the plane. I'm like, Coloradan. Every time. Because our identity comes out in our clothing. When Jesus comes to the Laodicean church, he finds that they had traded their precious garment and the identity that they had as sons and daughters of the living God. They had traded it and bartered it away just like the prodigal son did for the perishable things of the world. And like the prodigal son, it had left them naked and full of shame. But Jesus was telling them in those verses to the Laodicean church, I want to clothe you again. I want you to wear this precious and invaluable white garment woven by virtue of my suffering on the cross that I might restore you once again and take away your nakedness and shame. Buy that from me. Buy that from me. And when I say buy the white garment... This is not a garment you can purchase by your own action. You just have to come close to him and say, Lord, here I am. Will you give this to me? Because not one of us can pay the price for that garment. You can't scrub hard enough. The Bible says that your righteousness is like filthy rags before him. We can't scrub hard enough to make our garments white, but we can draw near to him. We can live near his flame. We can allow him to prune us when make us into his image and into his likeness and transform us into his holiness. We can't, and not one of us can make ourselves holy, but we can draw near to the Holy One and allow him to lead us into places of purity and victory in our life as we take up the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ as we're connected to the vine of the Lord Jesus as we have daily transaction with him you can draw close to him and you can allow him to place that white garment upon you that you would arise as the spotless bride of the Lord Jesus will it cost you yes Saying yes to him daily is a costly thing. Applying the cross daily to our lives is a costly thing. But there is no more precious gold, nor garment of greater honor. Thirdly, he says, buy from me Saul to anoint your eyes so that you may see. We're a generation that can no longer see. And the tragic part about it is, we don't even know it. We don't even know it. There's this story about this man, this blind man named Bartimaeus. He's outside of a city called Jericho. This one thing Bartimaeus has, he knows he's blind. He knows he's blind. He knows he's hungry. He knows he's cold. And it causes him to do something that I think is a secret How do you buy? This is how he buys from the Lord. As Jesus is walking by, he cries out and he says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And they tell him, everyone who was around Jesus, even those of his disciples, I mean, everyone is like, hey, quiet, blind Bartimaeus. He's like, no, I'm buying from him. I'm not buying from you. I'm buying from him. And he cries out all the louder, the Bible says, and he says, Jesus, son of David, 
Have mercy on me. And there's something about his humility and his desperation that unlocks the Lord and says, I'm going to do business with you. Let me tell you who the Lord Jesus is going to do business with in this end time hour. With a humble and a desperate people. Blind though you be, it's not what you have that will gain your sight. It's what comes out of him in Mark chapter 8 verse number 22. Jesus comes and he spits on a blind man's eye and he is healed. There is nothing of this world that can give you the sight and the perspective of heaven and the vision of heaven unless the Lord comes and spits in our eye and we do some transaction with him. And we get before him in a humble and a desperate manner. That's who his fire is going to be on. Show me a humble man. Show me a humble woman. Show me a desperate man. Show me a desperate woman. And I will show you a man and a woman who will see. Y'all okay? Okay. I've tried for years to calm down. Can't help it. (laughs) Lastly, Jesus tells them, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Though the Laodicean church had shut him out, he was on the outside. He wasn't in their homes. He wasn't in their church. He was outside. Though they had shut him out, he had not left them. Such is our Lord. And he remained there knocking at their door, though they had no more time for him. But I do want to say this one caveat. Though he suffers long, dear friends, he does not suffer always. But at that moment for the Laodicean church, it was an opportunity. It was a moment in fact, when he says, behold, I stand at, that Greek word for at is the, is the Greek word epi. It means I'm, I'm, I'm right there. I'm right now. Right now. Not tomorrow I'm knocking at your door. Not the day after. Not I did and you missed it. He said right now. Epi, I'm right there at your door. Right now I'm knocking on the door of your heart. And I'm contending. Would you open the door? Would you hear my voice? Number one. And would you open the door and let me in? There's something about hearing the voice of the Lord. But I think a key to buying and transacting with Him happens when we turn, when we open the doors. There is an action, there is a heart posture, there is a movement, there is a something in Revelation chapter 1. John the Revelator, Revelation chapter 1 verse number 8, John hears the voice of Jesus. He's, as you, you know, he's exiled to the island of Patmos. He's by himself. Sometimes, friends, when God has you alone, that's a season of an encounter. Some of you, you're alone and you're wondering why you're alone. It's because God has you in a season of encounter. He's getting you ready that every other place, every other voice, every other dependency, every other wealth, every other agora, that you would come into a place of hunger because a hungry people, a desperate people, a humble people are in a place to hear from God. And John, the John, the apostle is there on the island and he's there and he hears these words he hears Jesus say I am the Alpha and Omega says the Lord who is and who was and who is to come the Almighty and the Bible says in Revelation chapter 1 12 that he turns to see him it was so interesting to me that Jesus came from behind him or from some place that wasn't directly in his vision And I think there's a key there about how God interacts with men and with women. 
He heard the voice. But he just didn't stop at hearing the voice. The Bible says, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. Church, I believe this is an hour and a time that God is telling his people, Turn and see. Turn and see. Moses, as he saw the burning bush, he turned aside to see the wonder of God. And that was how he transacted with God. For some of you, there is some turning and seeing like you have never done before that God is inviting you into that you might behold who he is. Because when John turns to see, when he pursues him in a way, when he, when he, when he puts action to what is burning in his heart, he sees the image of the resurrected Christ. And what you gaze at, you will become. God knows that it wasn't by John's own merit, his strength, his ability, his righteousness, that he was going to be transformed into the image of Christ. But he did know that if he heard his voice, that if he turned to see, that if he looked at Jesus, that what he gazed at, he would become like and John sees the Lord and he says, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. And he has that image of the Lord. And he sees. And he is changed. And he has revelation. Because revelation doesn't come from anywhere else or anything else than the Lord Jesus Christ. When you see him, when you have a revelation of him, if, if you knew what garment he was weaving on that cross for you and you took on that identity as a son and a daughter of the Lord, son and daughter of Most High God, if you have a revelation of that, you'll never be the same. There's, there, there, in, in, a, in a generation that is hungry for identity, to know who you are, to know whose you are, to know what he has done, The Bible says, open the door. Today, church, that's my ask. Not for you, but like I said, for me. For me. I'll end with this. In Luke chapter 24, the disciples are returning from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Jesus is walking with them all seven miles of that road journey. They don't even know that it's him. But there's something that they do which causes a revelation of Jesus. There's something that they do that causes them to buy from him and transact with him. It says that as they're going, the Bible actually says that Jesus was acted like as if he was going to keep going. But then they say, Lord, would you earnestly come and be with us? Would you earnestly come home with us? Now, I don't know what they had going on that day, what their schedule looked like, what kind of chores they had, how much clutter they had in their home, but it didn't matter. They said, would you come home with us? And they rearranged their schedule and they rearranged their time and there was a desperation in their voice and there was an earnestness and a calling to them and that was a mechanism by which they began to interact. They didn't know it at the time. Actually, they were interacting with the God of heaven and earth who was walking alongside of them. And some of you, some of you, some of you, you've been walking through life and you're saying, where is God? And I want to tell you, he's been walking with you the entire time but your eyes haven't been opened yet that car wreck that thing there was so many things that should have taken you out but God had a purpose and a calling and a destiny for your life and he's been walking with you but there's a greater revelation there is a transaction he's saying buy from me oh church you might have drifted a little bit away your heart might be cold but epi right now right now right now he's standing at the door and he's 
knocking. And then when we say, Lord, I'm blind, I'm desperate, I need you. That's the way in which we buy from him and he comes home with them. Can you imagine Jesus walks into their home? He walks into their house and he breaks the bread with them. He takes the wine because Jesus wants intimacy with you. He wants to come home with you. He wants to know you and he wants you to know him. And when they break the bread and they take the wine and their eyes are open and they see him. And that's exactly how it ends for the Laodicean church. That's the call for the Laodicean church. He said, when you open the door to me, I will sup with you and you with me. Lord, let's pray together, church. Here we are. Church, I just pray that we would have transaction with the Lord today. I have a sense and I've had a sense and a feeling that there is those among us that God wants to do business with. The altars are open, wherever it might be, it's open. But God wants to have business with you today. Right now, not tomorrow, epi, epi, epi. And he's knocking on your heart and on my heart. And I just want to create some time and space and Brandon is going to close us out. But I want to pray this one prayer. Lord, make us desperate again. Show us our blindness. Revive us again, O oh Lord. May we buy from you gold refined in fire, a white garment that you have purchased with your own blood, and solve to anoint our eyes. We open the door to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite the campus pastors to come up at this time.